I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Uh, we have Adam joining us today for the Q&A. Tom, what do we have for questions? Just kick this off. Okay, yeah, good. Uh, we have a really good question from a gentleman named George. Uh, and this is Wilf. Uh, for, he has a question for you. He said, I wanted to ask you if you still got the field and research for the creatures, or are you more uh, reserved in your research? And he says, are you more concerned now for your safety as your knowledge grows about what these creatures are capable of? Has it affected you when you go out? Um, Two-part so. question. Um, I still go out when, whenever I'm able to. And yes, I am much more concerned these days. I, I know it's kind of yeah. a, kind of a quick quick answer there, but that's that's it in a nutshell. I, I do watch much more uh, for my own safety and anyone else that's with me because of what I know now, as opposed to say a few years ago. When you're when you're in the field, Will, what do you what are you alert to? In other words, what should people be listening for? You know, or are looking for like. You know, what's the trouble sign? <laughs> what do you not want to find? You know. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the first thing I look for, I look for the tree breaks and scat. That's usually the two big visual things you're going to find. That that alerts you to their presence, and then you look to see how fresh those things are. Uh, sometimes they're old. If they're old, it's you know. Then you, you look around and see if there's anything fresher. If you don't find anything more fresh, then I'm not as concerned because they're not currently in that location. Uh, if they're fresh, then I'm starting to listen also to see if I hear anything. Mm. Okay. Got it. And then of course tracks and what things are, like uh, that, what but. are, <clears throat> yeah. What are some of the things that you would hear? Do you hear howls or screams or what, what are some of the sounds that you listen for? Well, I'll typically stay out of those areas at night. I mean, sometimes we go to places where we can just listen and observe, um, you know, and remain stationary. We don't go you know, trundling around in their feeding areas at night, that's a no-no. Uh, that's that, that's a recipe for trouble. So, but in the daytime, uh, you might hear, you know, brush breaking. You might hear vocals. It's not, it just depends. I mean, the circumstances are always by situation. You know, it's never a cookie cutter kind of a thing. So if they're vocalizing or making any kind of noises, in other words, if it's rock clacking, tongue pops, things like that, then they're coordinating with each other, possibly about you or involved in a hunt. So you listen for things like that. Typically, you don't hear them, but it is possible. Uh, vocals, you might hear a sentry do some kind of a, a one-time vocal, and that would alert you know, the other members of that group in the area that there's danger present. Gotcha. Gotcha. So if you hear that, that's probably a good thing to, uh, so it's a message for you as well. Leave. <laughs> yeah. I, and I'll give you an example. And we've talked about this many times when we were up on the Olympic Peninsula camping one time on the Quinault River. Uh, we went for a walk at right at dusk after having a meal. And on the way, you know, taking a nice slow walk back to the camp, there was, um, this ridge that divided the two forks upper forks of the Quinault river and this creature was on that ridge not actually not very high in elevation you know a couple hundred feet and it was it was near where people were there was a campground on, on either side of this uh, ridge that divides the river and this scream i can't even describe it never heard anything like it um was super loud lasted for what seemed like ever and but it was a one-time thing and and my thoughts were and still are that that was a sentry you know just either giving the campers hell or you know maybe it was a new sentry you know discovered people in this area and then let everybody let the rest of the group know and it would have been heard for miles um wow 
that there were humans present there. Wow. What's the usual distance between, like, a, or, or if we know, between where the sentry is and where the backup, or where, where the rest of them, are, more or less, are? It's, it's something we don't really know, but it's got to be within hearing range. Okay, yeah. So you could be a fair distance. I mean, could be sure. close, could be a long ways away. Because, you know, when you were saying uh, that they're, they move or they can move at 45 miles per hour, so their their idea of a long way away is probably very different from <laughs> our idea of a long way away, you know. Right, and, and we know that speed, they can run that fast because uh, when we had Lee on the show, for those who remember that interview, he was in a place in Northern California here where he actually saw one of the creatures and it, it, it he actually marked the time from a known spot. I can't remember if it was a, a street sign or what it was the creature was by when he first clocked or, you know, turned on his or checked his time to, um, you know, clock how fast it was going. So between that first fixed position, known fixed position, and then where it ran across this big open field, and he took me to the place and showed me uh, to an un, another fixed spot. He was able to calculate very accurately by the amount of time and the distance it ran, how fast it was going, and he clocked it at 45 miles an hour. Got it. Whoa. So, so they may be yelling at something that's like three or four miles away, but that doesn't mean they couldn't close that space very, very fast. Yeah, absolutely. They, yeah, very quickly. Yeah. Wow. Impressive. Well, and that, you know, that kind of dove, dovetails with what we hear, that these creatures are very, very quick. People have reported, right, that their, their movements are just lightning fast. And, yeah. And, 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 you know, the, the, the witnesses that just get a glimpse and then they come back with stories of these, these things having supernatural powers and whatnot. And, and because like they saw it for one second and then it was like, bang, gone. I think they're just, I, my suspicion is that in what they actually witnessed was, you know, them going from zero to 45, you know, and vanishing into the cover, into the woods, just super fast. And so since they've never seen anything do that, you know, they're, they hang something supernatural on it, you know, <laughs> you know yeah, what absolutely. I mean? And we're going to talk about this on another show. Um, you know, if we can get Dalton and Rusty on with Tom, because they had an experience with Tom, you saw one of these things move and yeah. you can describe how quick that was. Yeah. So what I saw was, and the best way I can describe it is it, it was so fast. I was looking through a tunnel in the forest and it was an area where we, were, we had just encountered them and <clears throat> so there i believe they were maneuvering around us but as as if it was almost as if it was done before it started you know it was that fast wow um you know and getting back to well i want to say weird this whole topic is weird um <laughs> But we have a question, and this this one comes up quite a bit, um, both with us and with uh, you know the Bigfoot community. Okay, so we've had I can remember right off the top of my head two guests that we've had on, and they have described. They said its eyes appeared to be glowing uh, without a source of light. That you know it's it's they're, they're so the question is. Are they self-illuminating? And and I'll just give my thoughts, and then I'll ask Will for his opinion. I think it's interesting. We have seen no evidence of that, and it would be, as far as I can tell, that would be kind of self-defeating. That would be like ears that can produce their own sound. Um, <clears throat> it would, you know, you if, if it's doing that, if your eyes are self-illuminating, then you're going to be blind to what's in front of you, right? It's it, and right. some bioluminescent. Uh, thing. Well, we have to take a look at the animal kingdom. There are no mammals that have self-illuminating eyes. Um, and then you have to ask, if they did, what would be the evolutionary advantage to something like that? And like you pointed out, um, you know, something that's an apex predator is certainly not going to want to give its location away. If they hide their scat in areas they're hunting, um, 
you know you wouldn't want your eyeballs glowing and, and letting a potential meal know that you're present um so when we get reports like this and again you know things like very mundane things things that we we see every day like the moon if it um and adam you could probably speak to this too because you're you, you know you're very well versed in lighting and things like that doing film work Sure. Um, the presence of something like even even a partial moon uh, that somebody may not even think about might be enough of a light source to cause uh, reflection in eyes, you know, like these creatures. And it could be something because, you know, encountering one of these creatures is such a traumatic experience. <clears throat> you know, your mind is grasping for every piece of information it can at that moment. So things like, you know, mundane sources, mundane things around you, like moonlight, for example, uh, you wouldn't even be aware of. Yeah, I, I, the thought that always comes back to me when they, you hear about the red eyes and they seem to be glowing is two points. One of them is the, the distinct possibility that they see infrared. And so it, an eyeball that can observe the infrared spectrum is going to have a different lining you know or, or an ad additional properties to the lining of that eye and so my uh, extrapolation of that theory <laughs> so here goes part two I'm going to take that theory and build a theory on it but if, if right if the eye lining does let them see infrared then um Part two, the, the re we would need to be able to kind of test the, the reflective property of that. In, and so what does an eyeball with an infrared lining look like when, it, when there's an ambient light source around it and everything else is dark? So the only thing you would get is something reflected off of that, you know, infrared readable eyeball. And um, my, my suspicion is that it's always going to be driven by the source of the light. And these guys that are saying uh, they saw red eyes, um, I, I'm quite sure that there's some kind of light source which when infrared, you know, when the infrared uh, layer kick, you know, reflects that light back, it reflects the red light and it absorbs the blue and the green type of thing. And so, um, you know, just like, color works with everything right but in in this case uh somebody's flashlight maybe the taillights of a car maybe um the ambient light from the moon absolutely maybe even you know i don't know uh, ambient light from the stars even possibly i mean you know uh we know their eyesight is is definitely really really good uh and it possibly that reflection being uh I don't want to say filtered, but being focused right through their through mm -hmm. their uh, the lenses in their eyes, um, you know, all, all this stuff adds up to what is kind of a yes, it 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 would be kind of a clue to human beings, right? <laughs> Who would go, oh my goodness, there's eyeballs looking at me, and they're the size of golf balls or tennis balls, you know, uh, almost like uh, you know, nature is giving us a tiny little uh, a little heads up shall we say you know that there's there's these giant creatures that are nearby that do not mean us well you know yeah and, so, and, and I mean, that, know. oh go ahead i'm sorry no i was just going to say that that when i you know it, it, during the uh, boggy creek incidents um there were that were kind of showcased in the film there was a lot of mention of the red eyes and um the accounts that i've read of the of the incidents in that area have included accounts of both you know red eyes and yellowish eyes uh, so you know and i and i would love we just gotta we just gotta get this footage you know i i would love to see what they're seeing when they say it's a red eye what what exactly does that look like you know is exactly. it stop sign you know what I mean? Is it stop sign red or is it just kind of like pink? You know, what, what, what is that? What is that color? And, and, I, and I could give some input on this too. It's interesting, you know, John Green with all of his files, um, everybody, the media especially, focused on, they focus on certain things that they think are interesting. 
and the red eye shine was one that everybody jumped on. Yeah. Same thing with odor. And in truth, Green mm-hmm. only had seven reports of red eyes. The rest wow. were amber or bluish. And I know from my own personal experience over the last almost five decades, I've seen eye shine a number of times, and it's always been amber. I've, gotcha. ne- I've never seen a red red eyes. Um, seen them very close on a couple of occasions, and they were amber. You know, blinking, you know, very, very large, very bright eyes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and we do know it is the light source that will affect the coloring that people see. But in those cases where, uh, and I, I know there was even a story one time where someone told me that, you know, their eyes were actually throwing light out like flashlights, and they thought, well, that's just absurd. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, there's something else going on there. Yeah, the mushroom picker told you that story. Yeah, or right. I, I think in f- deep sea fish that have bioluminescence, I, I uh, think that's for actually attracting uh, prey. Oh, yeah. You know, right. so it, that would not be something that would happen yeah. in forests of North America or elsewhere. No. Oh. Yeah, you don't feel attracted. You see these glowing eyes. You're like, I think I'm going to go check them out. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I'm going <gonna, laughs> to pick well, up my flute and I'm going to go over there and play flute music to Ned. No, yeah. Yeah, no, no. Well, so the ones that you saw, uh, and I think I know one of them. One of the, I think one of the incidences was at um, Yakult. Is that right? We had a, There were a couple of incidents at Yakult where we had eye shine. So did they appear to be, uh, did they have that kind of glowing effect that we're talking about or reflective? Very much so. Uh, There was one time the family called me out, and I think it was the night where they saw the female. And when I got there, uh, the creature had left the yard, but they didn't go very far. They were out in the fields. There were two of them. And they were maybe, I don't know, 100, 200 feet apart. Uh, one was actually near a fixed spot, so we actually knew the height. Uh, there was two, two, had two poles and an across member across from that, like you would see. I think it was actually by the corral. And it was eight feet high, and these eyes were up near the very top of that. And we could see them. We were, you know, we were probably 100, 150 feet away from that individual the other one was a little bit closer off to our left but you know they you would see them turn their heads you know as we shined lights they would blink their eyes they didn't really move one did walk away at one point the closer one but um they weren't afraid of us you know the eyes were by the light source we had flashlights so you know we'd see the eyes but they weren't super bright uh, but now down by the fire station we had lights they were you know 30 40 50 feet away from us behind the trees and we would see these very large eyes very bright because they were close to us so the uh. so the eye shine was brighter very bright in fact right there and there were probably there were four or five individuals around us wow and and we were scared let me tell you we i felt like we were lucky to get out of there they they didn't do anything they were kind of menacing uh, but they let us go but, the, wow. but there was a group of us, too. There were, I don't know, five or six of us in there. That's right. I, I remember reading that in that in your book, Haunted Valley. Yeah, that was... It, that, was, that was, it was scary, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we did not well, expect me, to encounter them in there. Gotcha. Yeah, well, it was... I looked at it on Google Earth, and I was like, well, this is not that far from... I mean, you got some houses nearby. you got the fire station... Um, it's right on it wasn't the southern exactly, edge of the town. Yeah, it was not in the wilderness. No. Well, you know, Haunted Valley, I guess they just they just feel like that's still their home, no matter how many subdivisions you throw in there. Yeah. Well, and you, can, and you can look on Google Earth today, and, and it looks very different than it did back in 1989 also. Uh, yeah. My goodness. Okay, so we got a question here, and that is regarding, and this is, you know, it's not a big secret. These things do take people from time to time. 
are we aware of any situations where they've, if you have a group of people and they'll take more than one, or if they take somebody when others, other people are nearby? In other words, if you have a group of people, are you safe as opposed to being out uh, entirely by yourself or away from a group? Yeah, it's a situation that goes by the numbers. If there's a group of you, um, <clears throat> you're safer because they're going to be more wary of a group of people. If you're by yourself, you might simply be an opportunity. Wow. Okay. And then I'm going to, uh, but there was one exception that I think we know of, and that was the one in the Flathead Reservation, where they just snatched some guy off the porch. Yeah, there's a few, actually. I mean, you can even go back to the Chetco monster, monster story um, from Southern Oregon. I can't remember the year off the top of my head, but um where that particular at least there was one individual they didn't really i don't think they knew if there were more but there was certainly one that was very aggressive and two of the uh i can't remember if they were loggers or miners but two of the men miners i think they're miners yeah two of the men went actually and i believe the thing was screaming they went out to confront it and and it was interesting, I, you know. In in the story, it doesn't mention how the creature killed those two men, but in Ivan Sanderson's book, um, and he must have been privy to more information, more detailed information of the story, which I found fairly gruesome. Where the creature uh, apparently had taken the men by their feet or legs and slammed them on the ground, apparently a number of times where it appeared as though they had fallen off a high uh, location uh, to their deaths, but there were, it was no high ground there, so they knew what uh, and how these things, or how this thing had yes. killed them. Yes, wow. It just smashed them, huh? Yeah, they were smashed. So you have, you have a multiple humans in that case that were killed, um, and then, like you said, you know, at the Flathead Reservation also. You know, where the well, older that, gentleman was grabbed off his porch where other men were nearby. Well, and, and in that story, like, he was he was snatched off the porch. The other men pursued, but um, broke off the chase. They saw, The trail was good, but they broke off the chase. Um, uh, I, I, and then... The creature found, dropped him. Yeah, the, right. They found the guy the next... The, the, there was, like, a few hours later, it was dawn in there or something, and they, they uh, found the man... But he, he died of his injuries, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, but then he was he was old and frail, so yeah, it would have been would have been a pretty rough. Yeah, being, it would have been a pretty rough trip being hauled off by something and then off through the timber at high speed. Yeah, and uh, there was another snatch and grab that uh, our uh, our friend in uh, the Indian reservation in New Mexico, uh, Belinda, Linda, Linda. Oh, Bre um, Brenda Harris. Brenda Harris. There we go. Uh, who she told us the story of the the man who uh, uh, he had a field that was near that river uh, on the reservation, and um, he owned it. And he was he was um, he had done some work on the field and didn't want to head all the way back to home, so he was camping out that night. And remember the creature picked up his tent and was walking away with him, and he unzipped the tent and hit the ground and ran the hell away and said, forget this, and then gave up on the field and the whole thing. Yeah, see, but if you're he, in the tent, you're just easy pickings. <laughs> yeah, it's a to-go bag. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Different version of DoorDash, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, and, and di we've talked about it. I think they probably like the taste of soft nylon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. The people oh, man, burrito. Yeah. <laughs> Take a look at that scat. Look for evidence of nylon. And, you know, oh, my gosh. You know, well, Will, you saw some scat with plastic in it. Yeah, you know, we've talked about this. There, You know, when you go to the grocery store to the produce section, they have those little thin, clear bags, you know, to put your produce in. And I found a pile of scat. It was obvious Sasquatch scat because of the size. And in one of the segments was a whole, one of those bags, a whole bag in there. <laughs> so I guess whatever, whatever was tasty in the bag, they just said, well, hell, bag and all. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. 
I, I have to say, I had to scratch my head and laugh about that one when we found it. Oh, man. Wow. They're not very discriminating, are they? They're not really, no. So, you know, if you're in the tent, well, you might find chunks of, uh, you yeah. know, tent and, <laughs> and their poop. I don't know. <laughs> wow. Tent flap. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I want the titanium tent. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes, well, the bunker. As they say, bring your own cement, make your own bunker. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, if you were in one of the, the Silver Stream trailers, wouldn't they look at that like a, a can of tuna? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just, bet they would. Just peel it open, get the goodies out. <laughs> Ow. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. This is uh, Park Service is going to love this podcast, let me tell you. <laughs> Set. Oh, but I, I had a question about that. Um, so, with this whole, uh, you know, COVID and public lands, you know, being uh, closed down and parking shut off and things like that, they they finally uh, let you uh, park in the Angeles Forest uh, a couple months ago. But um, uh, you know, in the beginning, that everything they they closed everything they could to discourage people from you know, outside activities, things like that. And uh, I just wondered if you had any reports of activity in these areas that suddenly don't have human traffic, um, if there was an, any increase. Of course, I mean, I, I would assume it would be a forest ranger reporting or somebody who would have a reason to still be there, you know, or, uh, I don't know, maybe a poacher would run in and with, with, with less people around, you, you know. I don't know. What have you heard anything of if, if our behavior has affected their behavior in this yeah, way? Absolutely. We're, what we're seeing is, and not just with these creatures, but other wildlife as well, uh, they very quickly fill in the areas where humans had previously been very active and present. Uh, and with our absence, you know, wildlife has filled those voids very quickly. So we've seen a lot of that, actually. Oh, uh, Okay. Well, and that was, you know, that's been reported. It wasn't just here in the U.S., but you know, the there was mountain goats or some sort of a native mountain goat in uh, Wales uh, that were coming into town that people had never seen before in, in town. Wow! And they just, I mean, herds of these things came up, and um, wow. you know, were feasting on the, you know, whatever plants were in the town square. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> wow. Oh, that's funny. I, I wonder about how that would affect or, or what that phenomenon is like in, uh, in in Florida, where you have all those exotic animals that have been, you know, released into the wild. You know, I mean, on, on top of the swamp, you know, the skunk apes, you've got you got chimpanzees and anacondas and, you know, not, not to mention the, the alligator population that they have, which is uh I, don't, I think it's more normal now, but uh, for a while, as I recall, the alligator was uh, on a on a do not hunt list. I don't think it was necessarily endangered, but I know that the the populate the alligator population recovered within like it, it was it was impressive. It was probably like two or three years. Suddenly, they had too many. You know, wasn't there an article recently also of saltwater crocodiles being seen there? You know, people apparently getting them and then releasing them. Oh my gosh! Which are the ones that get really big, right? Yeah, and they're aggressive. And they're aggressive, yeah. Oh yeah, you know. Well, go ahead. You know, we're 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 talking boots and purses here, <laughs> <laughs> or or a reason to stay out of Florida. I don't know, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I'm <laughs> opting for the latter. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a little too much wildlife. It's like, what you guys doing, bringing it in? What were you thinking? Oh, impressive. Yeah, there, one of those, uh, this is uh, slightly off topic. Well, slightly. Um, but, uh, you know, Africa had one of those saltwater crocodiles which suffered gigantism. And it was four times the size of a normal crocodile. And uh, I, his name escapes me. He, he did finally pass away. But um, he was responsible for quite a few villagers uh, going missing, you know, uh, as he, you know, he just had lunch with those things. And, and there are some photographs of this creature. Um, Natural Geographic, some I forget who, but um, but it's they did a documentary on it. I saw oh, that. Oh, that's right, that's right. There's even yeah, a they they tried yeah. to catch this thing, and not only was it huge, but it was smart. 
Yes. Very, very intelligent, very cagey. Yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't too impressed with this gigantic metal thing that, if I recall, it really was only about big enough to hold the creature stuffed inside it. So I don't really know <laughs> why you these know, guys well, <clears throat> go back. No, that's it good. would go up. It, it would approach that cage, and you would see the eyes, a pair of eyes, and they would stare at this cage for the long... Because they hung a bunch of chicken meat inside the cage. Gotcha. And it would come up, and then it was like, nah, something wrong here. <laughs> See, now, yeah. now think about that with a reptile. When reptiles yeah. aren't the smartest things on the planet. And oh. then you look at these creatures who are, you know, not just a primate, but probably a hominid, and how intelligent they are. They think they're just going to be dumb, you know, oversized apes, you know, wandering around aimlessly through the forest. That's not the case, folks. These things are extremely intelligent. And they're going to avoid people. Gotcha. gotcha. Well, and that would explain the whole thing with, well, gosh, why why don't we pick them up on game cams? Right. Oh, right. Yep. Yep. They they know that game cam doesn't belong there, right? And they probably see it's infrared beam if it's if it's using infrared. They do. And and here's the thing too, when you read about chimps and other higher primates. You know, if it doesn't belong in their environment, they are extremely wary of those objects, uh, and especially human-made objects. They know that's not something to be near, and they will, you know, they'll go to great lengths to avoid, especially human-made objects that are in their environment. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that that is perfect for uh, this next question. We got Chris. Uh, Chris wants to know... Uh, Will, in your opinion, could Sasquatch at least be some sort of a descendant or somehow related in the tree, I guess, of Gigantopithecus? Uh, I don't think so, because Gigantopithecus was a large ground-dwelling ape. Um, these things are not apes. Okay, now that's that probably requires a lot more explanation, but... Um, I think we'd need to bring John, our anthropologist, on to really give a, a, a good rendition of that answer. And maybe we'll do that. But um, they know, scientists do know, that there were at least seven different hominid species that existed simultaneously. Probably a lot more. John even said that. There could be, I mean, who knows, 10, 15, 20. Nobody knows because the remains have yet to be found of these of other species. Um you know, so these guys are probably a remnant of one of those many other hominids, hominids that did exist at the same time as us. And they probably predate us because native folks talk about these things being here when their ancestors came. So they, they predated humans in a lot of these areas. Yeah, and, that's a good point. And, and there's, since there's four types, right, it seems like the type twos with the eye teeth that are long and pointy. Right, the canines. <clears throat> yeah, with the canines. I mean, it's almost, maybe Gigantopithecus didn't lead to these creatures, but it's, all, it's, it's interesting that they would have created variations, you know, the eye teeth and things like that, that, right. uh, that seem to indicate that there were like similar conditions that required that kind of adaptation. Yeah, and, and even look at human beings, Homo sapien. Um, I've read articles where, you know, they think that humans originated not just in one location, but at least a couple different areas, you know, uh, in, uh, in Asia and Africa, you know, so not necessarily all from, you know, one particular stock. It's fascinating. You know, so these guys, you know, obviously developed on their own, uh, as did other hominids and, and higher primates. Gotcha. It seems like it was some, something tells me the answer to the, the the lineage question is going to have a lot to do with the type four Sasquatch, which are much more the Neanderthal. Very much so. Yeah. You know, smaller and and uh, yeah, it just seems to me like that's there's there's something in that DNA if we can get a hold of it, if we can get a get a good analysis of it, you know, something strong that. Uh, that's going to tell us. That's going to tell us a lot. You know, Adam, the Type Four is for me. I mean, they're all fascinating, but that one is particularly interesting because 
it is so different than the other uh, types. Yeah. It's, it is more, uh, yeah, much closer to a human. Um, Will, this is a question for you. And this is, uh, and you have some experience in this uh, going back, or, or some, uh, maybe you have some accounts. But this gentleman wants to know, um, regarding the the uh, the fires, the current fire wildfire situation in Northern California, what effect could this possibly have on the Sasquatch population? I think what he's asking is, hey, if we can get burned, can these things get burned? Uh, have you heard any stories about these things uh, in relation to wildfires? Yeah, some. Um, it does affect them, obviously. Uh, sometimes it's an opportunity because you know the game animals just are, are fleeing for their lives and these things take advantage of that um i remember you know talking with a gentleman at the klamath reservation when i was working on my first book and he was telling me a story about uh there was a, a native firefighting crew there and you know they were spread out and i'm very familiar with that because i fought forest fire once and um I think they were probably sweeping the area for hot spots, and this thing come charging out of the area that was burning, you know, the hair smoldering, and, and it kind oh. of charging right through the native group there and fell oh. down and left handprints. And apparently the handprints were cast and wow. on display in a location in Klamath Falls for years. And then, I, I don't know, whoever had them there took them or, or whatever, but they were gone. We didn't get a chance to see them. But that was one account, and um, I, I know someone in in this state that's um, I, I, I won't mention his title or anything. He's an official with you know the firefighters, <clears throat> and he said him and another one, another gentleman of his same level, were having a discussion in one of the big fires here a year or two ago, and they had a food drop, and they suddenly saw one of these things sneaking up on the food drop so you know they they weren't all just you know running and fleeing and in, in fear of the fire they were you know they were taking advantage of things that were um you know open to them to do that you know that begs the question how did they know that there was food in there they apparently were watching uh, yeah, you know, and it goes because, back to how intelligent they are. Exactly, and it wasn't a large group of people there. Some of the support people, and I'm sure they probably saw them eating from that pile of food, and wow. probably figured, well, and and I can give you another account, you know, of them sneaking up on stuff. Uh, back in 1988, uh, in Skamania County, I got a report from a, a helicopter logging crew that uh, you know they had seen one of these things, and and apparently the pilot when he was hoisting up one of these logs saw uh down below one of these creatures sneaking up on where the work crew had they'd all set their lunch boxes on this little knoll and the creature <laughs> was sneaking up on their lunch boxes and, and you know they, they radioed down and said hey you better go get your lunches something sneaking up on them and then when we went there we did find i did find a line of 18 inch tracks and so it did support the account but you know we, we've heard this a few times Wow. Oh my goodness. So they, they they stay away from objects like trail cams, but if you left your lunchbox in the woods It's gonna be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean you think about it, what you know you're not gonna get anything out of a game camera, but you know, if there's yeah. lunch over there, hey, you know, I'm gonna go That's have a bite. Right. That's it. You, we, so I guess you have to do the conflict of interest, right? You've right. got to put the game cam and the lunchbox together, and what are they going to do? What are they going to choose? <laughs> but then again, on the game cam, if they see the infrared light, then they're going to stay away from that. That's a, a big deterrent for these things. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's funny. You know, it would be interesting to talk to the guys, uh, the native crew that had this thing just barge in the group of them. What yeah, were apparently you it was thinking it was, it was smoldering and it just was trying to get away from the fire. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I just Man. want to know what their reaction was. You know, it's like, oh, I, I think he, he told me they, they were, uh, let's say, stunned, you know, as, <laughs> as, as, as a good base term there. <laughs> I, I don't think they were very happy about that happening to him. Oh, oh my gosh. 
Wow. It, it would have been the yep. proverbial underwear changing moment, I, I believe. Right. And and you don't know if it's going to happen again. So you, now you're you're not only putting out fires, but you're on edge. Your situational awareness is both for fires and these things. Yeah, the thing the thing got up after it fell down and just kept running. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it got its tushy singed or what, but uh, it wasn't. It was fleeing. <laughs> Time to go. Oh man, yeah, you got enough problems with a fire. Last thing you need is a Sasquatch throwing himself in the middle of you guys. Right, a smoke, <laughs> a smoking Sasquatch. Smoking. Now, now, really. how do you how do you build the insurance? I was mowed down by a scared Sasquatch running out of the fire. <laughs> right. How'd you break your arm? I got knocked over by. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, there was footage here of a bull that, uh, uh, in in uh, I guess it was more of one of the central Cal Fire. The uh, I want to say the Lake Fire, uh, the the one that's uh, in the Angeles Forest uh, down here. There was footage of uh, the the news crew was getting footage of you know the fire truck and the firemen and they were getting their hoses ready and everything. And down from down the hill. The fire was on the other side of the hill. Down the hill comes a uh, a bull, like a, a, a longhorn. That you know, I guess he got out of the corral and uh, he w- he wasn't hanging around, you know, and d- he went running right through all those guys, and they, they they all jumped out of the way. So yeah, yeah, it's kind of a similar type of situation. Yeah, yeah, it's too soon to be barbecue for that guy. He's like right. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay, so one of the questions is also that this and I like this one. This is, came from somebody who they want to know about the uh, foot pads of the creatures. Uh, we've heard that they, you know, one well, somebody commented that they, it's actually a kind of a grayish material, like almost like the pad of a dog's paw. And um, any, uh, do we have any information on that? Well, I can't really speak to the underside um, of the foot. When I first, when I had my first encounter, you know, that close one, I did get a pretty good look at, at its feet uh, because that's the part that was moving. So my eyes kind of focused on that first, you know, for a brief moment. Um, mm-hmm. And and the skin was gray colored. It wasn't uh, a flesh tone like ours. It was very grayish. I thought, you know, uh, what I saw in between the hair. So I'm assuming the underside would probably be similar. Um, now, unlike a dog's foot, you know, that, and then like ours and, and other animals where they have calluses, these things, you know, I don't really know because looking at all the footprint casts I have here in the office, um, it's obvious that the foot, the bottom of their feet is is fairly soft and thick, the pad, because... It conforms in many cases around objects that it steps on. Um, in other words, it, like with the Patterson tracks, one of the casts that Bob Titmus cast, he cast ten tracks uh, after you know Patterson and Gimlin were there a number of days later, and one of those tracks, uh, and and people have commented that it was some kind of mid tarsal break or blah blah blah, but what it was in actuality, and DeHinden told me this is when they when they cast that track <clears throat> there was actually a tree limb buried under the river sand there the creek sand mm. and and that foot pad molded around that ah. so that's what you're seeing and, and there are some of the other tracks not just from the patterson film site uh, there are two of them i'm looking at uh actually three where you know there's uh some object or, or the way the you know the sand was you know or something in it rocks or what have you, where that pad molded itself around that object instead of pushing it in. And there are other tracks from Bluff Creek that exhibit the same characteristics, and from other areas as well. So, um, you know, getting back to what that bottom of the foot looks like, it's it's got to be very soft, and the foot moves in a way, and that that soft pad probably helps them climbing objects. You know, I think it might have another function, and I'm just thinking of this when you're uh, describing this. You know, when we walk through the forest, 99.99% of the people who walk through the forest, especially if there's a lot of twigs on the ground, are not barefoot. They're, they're wearing boots or shoes or hiking, you know, some hiking shoes. 
those are going to make snapping sounds. But when these yes. creatures walk, they have that soft pad that mm-hmm. will, if it snaps underneath, you're not going to hear it. It'll it muffle, muffle the sound. It. Yeah, exactly. Which could explain why people are like, my gosh, it moves silently through the woods. Well, that's that's what it does. It's not a supernatural thing. It's very, very natural. Yeah, it's, it's a very mundane explanation, which <clears throat> would fit these occasions. I, I had a question about the toes, uh, since we're talking feet. Because um, I, I recall there being some prints where it, it appeared that the toes were sort of they looked like people toes and yet they also looked like they were almost not like fingers but but curled under in other words mm-hmm. like there was a there was a three digit there was a, a three bone structure to them instead of like more of a you know a two bone structure like our toes have our human toes have and that it was it was curled under almost like you'd make a fist you know um, and and when we Heard the reports of how how agile they are going up the side of a cliff, uh, and how they've actually they actually when they do that spider walk and they're like flat on the ground but they're moving with their fingers and toes, you mm-hmm. know, and they're they're in that thing. It just seems like uh, so. My question is, I guess, is the uh, what do we know about the toes on these creatures? It seems like they got a lot more going on with those toes than than we do. Yeah, it was felt <clears throat> early on by the original people, you know, John Green, Renee De Hinden, all those folks, that based on on the appearance of the tracks, because partly because of the big ridge between the toes and the fore part of the foot, yeah. that these creatures walk with their toes curled. Huh. Uh, huh. And and that curling and, and most and a lot of the cast look that way. Uh, yeah. and most of the cast <clears throat> You only see you see the the fore part of the foot, the pad, and then there's a large ridge underneath of that between that and where the toes are. And the toes are just uh, the the description John Green gave was, you know, like peas in a pod. We okay. just have these round toes, and even tracks today. You know, the most recent ones we got were last week uh, from yeah. Arizona, and they they have that exact appearance. And which indicates that they're walking with their toes curled, which would be a function of helping them climb. Got it. You know, especially yeah. if that bone structure is, you know, like you said, maybe there's a, an additional bone in there, uh, unlike our feet, you know, yeah. that would grasp. And, 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 you know, when they talk, witnesses talk about them climbing these, you know, extremely steep rock faces and things like that. Yeah. Uh, that soft pad and those toes that would curl and maybe grasp uh, mm-hmm. would certainly give them that ability unlike us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, with the footprints, you know, we go, we talk back with the different variations. Uh, Tom and I have talked about this where, you know, just looking at the cast, I, there's about 20 of them sitting right here now. I have a lot of them put away, but because I just don't have the space in my office right now, but uh, the yeah. ones that are sitting here, <clears throat> there are differences in the feet. There are probably three different, just the ones I'm looking at right at the moment, there are three different variations of feet. Um, you know, whether that's from different types, could be, uh, mm-hmm. and, and probably is. Uh, but there are obviously some different functions with those feet, maybe adaptations to different types of terrain, so to speak. Gotcha. Gotcha. And Tom, I think we actually put some of those pictures up on the website, didn't we? Where we discussed that previously. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we have. There are some, um, and as we get new, uh, new information or new new footprints and that sort of thing, uh, yeah, we'll we'll post it on the website. Um, so here's a question: we we know about the tree breaks that these things do, but what we're not entirely sure of is the purpose the tree breaks do we have any um i, I don't know if anybody's interviewed one of these creatures but I, th- <laughs> I think there is some historic lore um with you know with the native americans and others that's the source that i got my information from was native folks and and we can look back first of all look at there's there's a story and it's i think it's in my first book i put it in there it was in sports field magazine and i don't remember the year uh, I think it was 1963, but don't quote me on that. 
uh, where there was a gentleman by the name of Tex Cobb, and they interviewed him. Uh, and, and part of the story, you know, it was about him trapping and, and things in Alaska. And him and another man were up there trapping, apparently, and I don't know when this was. It, must, it was sometime before the story was actually written. Uh, they were approached by a group of Indians, and uh, they didn't particularly like outsiders, but they respected this gentleman because, you know, he showed them respect with their traps and things, and, and they did likewise with him. You know, there was sort of a, not a connection, but mutual respect for each other's property. So they approached them, and they talked about a creature called Gilyuk. That's what yes. their, their name for it was. And they said it was a, they called it the shaggy giant who wears a little hat. I'm not sure what that reference is to, but, and they said yeah. they, they were hunting caribou and Gilyuk wasn't hunting caribou at eight men. So wow. they wanted the two white men to camp with them because uh, they said Gilyuk doesn't, won't molest white men. Apparently it would stay away from them if they were in the camp with the natives. So to prove that this creature was there, they said, we'll show you his sign. So they took him to a little area where there was this young birch sapling, I believe it was, and, and they described it as being twisted like a matchstick. Well, you have to remember what matchsticks were like back in those days. They were wooden matchsticks. And, yeah. and I remember, you know, my grandparents and some of the old timers, they would talk about their terminology was different than what we think of things today. So when you talk about twisting something, they meant breaking it. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So I thought about that when I first found the things that Bob Titmus showed me that he found in Bluff Creek. He would show me these, um, and they were relatively small branches, but he'd said while he'd be tracking these creatures, he'd follow a line of tracks. He said periodically he would find these, um, these small limbs snapped over and, and snapped and twisted over on themselves. And he says, I, I don't know, but they, maybe they're just walking along doing this. And, and it's possible. I, I didn't think much of it at the time because they weren't, I mean, it could have been done by anything, I thought. But he had piles of these things he'd collected in his house. Uh, I mean, many dozens of them. So it was, it was interesting. I kept it in the back of my mind. So in the early 90s, 91, I think it was, we were up in the Washougal River watershed. And we we didn't really, it was a very difficult location to get into took us five different trips to get into that watershed um you couldn't just wade up the river it was it was too deep and uh water was flowing too hard but we found our way in there by the fifth time so we didn't see anything in the watershed so we decided to hike up this uh one particular mountain over to a saddle that separated the washugal river drainage system from uh, another drainage system that actually goes over to yakult and oh, wow. we got about Oh, I don't know, three quarters of the way. If we were about 20, on the map, we were about 2,300 feet in elevation. And we stopped for a break because it was steep going and, and the brush was thick. And here was this young Doug fir tree, three inches thick, the trunk, and eight feet off the ground. And I know, I know it was eight feet because I measured it. Um, the tree, within two weeks of us finding it, had been snapped 90 degrees over. No, no dry rot. No animals had done that. I mean, it was incredible. So wow. we found a line of these about every hundred yards apart. I can't I think I counted thirteen of them before we figured we had to get out of there before it got dark. Uh, so wow. I, I talked to a couple Native American buddies of mine, and they kind of chuckled. They said, "Oh, you found this." <laughs> I said, yeah, "Okay, yeah. What, what is, just what is this?" And they and he confirmed. They said, "Yes, a Sasquatch had done this. It's what they do." He said, "At that time, he said there were." two main reasons they would do it uh, marking territory or in this case because there were a line of these and we found this elsewhere other people have found this uh, this was probably the alpha telling or they said the, the guy in charge you know telling the rest of them this is the way we're going to the next this is where we're going to the next feeding area so this is this is you're going to follow this uh, I did learn later from another native source that there was a third reason they would do it and it was in conjunction to areas of a lot of human activity. And I've actually found this up in Northern California where um, locals occasionally would go charging up there. And we've seen them do it uh, with their quads, you know, racing around up in that area. Uh, and there's this one particular open area, and it's surrounded by, by trees. 
and all around the perimeter of this open area where they dried quads were these trees snapped over around the whole perimeter and they would say that was as a warning to others of their kind uh, this is a place where there's a lot of human activity so stay away from it fascinating fascinating when you were talking about the the, the markers uh, where the you know uh, where the the alpha or the leader was saying you know this is the way to go follow this trail, I, I guess that that kind of was telling me that really the 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 unit was spread out. Yes. And yeah, so you know the, somebody's way ahead in the lead, and other people are who knows miles behind maybe. But this is the path. This is this is how you go. And it's, how, and it's how I found it. it was in the area, that whole area was the area I worked for a dozen years and was able to keep tabs on one particular group moving throughout their range. Um, so it didn't surprise me. Uh, the, the direction was to the northeast. And um, that, that was right in line with what I had learned over all those years for that particular time of year, how the group was moving through that range. So uh, it wasn't surprising you know that's what it was but it also wow. backed up because uh, sometimes you'd only find one maybe two sets of tracks in a partic- particular location but knowing there were four individuals at least in that group but that they were spread out quite a ways and sometimes we hear vocals and, and that would also support that fascinating but apparently when it was time you know, to the move, other thing that I- oh go ahead Tom no no I'm just going to say that uh, just going back to the uh the, the purpose of the tree breaks for some of these creatures, again, it's it's one more indication that they, for the most part, want to avoid humans. Right. You know, they have not gotten beyond that. They don't they don't want contact with us. And, you know, unless they want a meal or something. Well, and right. these were in, these were in right. very difficult locations to get to. They weren't near roads or trails or anything like that. I mean, we hiked cross country uh, for miles before we found these these. Uh, objects wow so so they they weren't those uh, that trail was more likely not warning about people since it's pretty far from no because people. because it was in line and each of those trees you'd go to one the first tree right and it was the the next one was within sight it was um you know because of the thickness of the brush it was just at the edge of a sight line and then the, the next one would be there so you'd go to that next tree that was broke uh, and exactly the same it was you know i'd measured them eight eight you know feet one inches things like that they were all within the same uh height within a couple of inches of each other and wow. you go to that one then you could look in this in the direction you were going and you would see another one and then you go yeah. to that one and you'd follow the same thing so it indicated a direction of travel gotcha wow that's fascinating these things are smart. Well, you know, they're well. They are. They're they're very intelligent. And after I heard that from Will, I have since gone to one of the areas that that I go to, and I got I found the same thing. Now, I did not find thirteen of them. I stopped at about three, but they're about a hundred, hundred ten yards apart. Right. And point to one. You went up the hill, and then you pointed the other one. A point and going around the hill. You go down there. There's another one. That one pointed down to a uh, like a little minute uh, very small lake mm. uh, but the slope angle on that was so steep i was like okay well I'll, they can go there i'm not i'm not yeah. Yeah, you can and, go down but you're not coming back and lisa that we had on the first segment found exactly the same thing where she's at you know this long line of and she we had the map she sent me the map where she marked all these trees and and it was doing exactly the same thing that i'd found wow you know what's interesting about that is I think the types that she – because she's in uh, upstate New York. Mm-hmm. So that's a totally different type than the ones that we have. You know, we have the type ones out here, which are predominant. It's not exclusive. Right. And so what does she have? She probably has a, you know, maybe a type two or a type four. Type fours are typically in that part of the country, but there are also type ones there. Okay. And I just find it interesting. If it is a different one, it just shows that they there's some commonality. I, I think there's some shared behaviors. But that was the way it was with Native Americans also. While there were very unique things among 
you know, individual tribes, uh, they did share some commonalities also. Well, like the owl hoots, right? The, the, that's been reported uh, with uh, Don Gummo up in Maine, mm-hmm. and it's been reported in the Pacific Northwest. I, I, I can't recall who, but, uh, you know, the 600-pound owl, you know, and and if, I seem to remember it was recorded. I think also. it was 800 pounds. 800, okay, I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, I was uh, the one who heard that. I was like, oh, my gosh. You got a uh, cow out there making owl sounds. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> and, well, but it, but Texas as well. I recall wasn't wasn't Joe telling us that uh, that he had heard heard that that jumbo owl? Yes. Down yes. Down oh there. yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So it seems like that's uh, another shared behavior. These things have. They all like to mimic owls. Well, for- now there's certain you know just like with uh, people. You know, everybody can do. I won't say the same things, but. Well, okay, let's look at chimps. Chimps are probably more simplistic, a little easier to work with. Uh, it's like with the the noises they make. They can all make the same noises, but they mean different things between individual groups. Gotcha. So it's probably along those lines. Fascinating. Well, you know, and, and, and it's people reporting these owls, right? So I almost wonder if it's some kind of some kind of affirmation to the other folks in their group that, Hey, we got people nearby. Let's sound like owls, you know, or, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, It's really hard telling. Um, yeah. I don't yeah. know at this point. Just guess, guessing here. But Adam, I gotta say, I love your description. The jumbo owls. Right. Jumbo. <laughs> <laughs> but now that those tree breaks have got to be a common behavior. It probably means the same thing among, different parts of the country it's a that's a learned behavior that they've picked up and it's been useful everywhere fascinating i wonder if like the type you know what's funny do it i just don't what's funny maybe they might uh you know what's odd is i have seen a few instances where i've seen the tree break okay and it's it's exactly what you're talking about they're dug firs you know three three and a half inches in diameter about you know, roughly seven and a half to eight feet tall, snapped over, perfect clean snap. I'm like, wow, look at that. And you take a picture of it, and then you go back maybe a week later, and you know, the and again, the top of the tree that's been snapped over, it's green, it's plush, it's green, it just happened. Mm-hmm. You go back a week later, it's gone, vanished. It's not it's nowhere to be found. You search the whole area. Mm-hmm. What happened with that? Well, oftentimes when they do something, when they manipulate something in their environment, they will not leave it there to be found by humans. Wow. And that makes sense. That absolutely is the only explanation. Wow. Because it's still kind of connected. So good luck going up there yourself and removing it for whatever reason. Are they tearing off? Are they just tearing off the piece that they broke? Are they like uprooting the whole damn tree? No, it's the piece that they broke. Okay. Uh, the the top part, you, you'll see it's broke. You're like, whoa, look at that. There, there's wow. another one, and then oh. you come back, maybe just you know, short period later, and gone, completely gone. So looking for signs of these creatures, even if let's say you don't find the tree break where it's broken over, but if you see that somebody snapped it at the eight foot level, that that even that right. a bit of a clue. You know, it could be, but I usually ignore that kind of stuff. I just okay. because lots of things can happen to trees. I mean, to me, you know, for good solid evidence, it's got to like slap me across the head. <laughs> you know what I mean? Gotcha. To be that <laughs> obvious, I, I don't. I, yeah. I'm pretty particular about what I'll say as evidence and what isn't. Um, I'd rather ignore a piece than make some claim yeah. that it is and not have any supporting evidence for it. Gotcha. Yeah, well, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, and you have to be. You do. That's right. You have to be careful that you want to eliminate. You know, weather breaks, because, uh, you know, snow breaks, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot of, yeah, you just have to look at the whole, the bigger picture. Right. I've got a quick question about uh, something that Don had brought up, um, because he was talking about uh, how there was an area on his property that he knew the creatures were using, but they weren't leaving a lot of tracks. And then it, he realized that they were actually 
moving from the moss covered stone to moss covered stone and they were so they were deliberately you know choosing terrain that was not going to leave tracks and i just wondered if that behavior had been if you'd heard of that from anybody else or your indians or you know. well it's something that's possible and here's why um you know something that you know leaves or hides its scat in an area and and yeah. predator, predators all predators will, will use their scat to mark an area saying this is mine stay out uh and mm -hmm. a bigger predator oftentimes will defecate on the scat of a smaller predator saying no this is my area now um i've seen it with these creatures where in areas they they'll they defecate everywhere and that may be to drive the uh, prey animals into an area where they want them uh, and in, oh. in that place you won't find any scat it's actually in the tree line hidden and sometimes we've had stories where they've actually covered their scat with moss or oftentimes they'll do it in water wow so they're actually if they're aware of they're doing these things with their scat and what it means to other creatures then their footprints mm -hmm. they must be aware of those as well and sometimes uh will you know avoid places where they're going to leave tracks in other places yeah. where they're prolific they either don't care or feel that there's not a threat in the area like with bluff That's creek sad. with bluff creek when they first started opening that area up to logging uh in the yeah. 50s people hadn't simply hadn't been in there so the right. tracks were prolific yeah wow 10 years later when the patterson film was made after that time next to impossible to find them wow wow and and today how which direction has it gone are they more relaxed now or have they kind of adapted to the human presence or are they they're, they still very skittish they're still skittish oh yeah okay all right very very cool well oh you know when you were talking about marking territory that reminds me of the the story of the couple that went camping uh by the lake and um they had gone swimming and they left their uh swimming trunks out to dry and they were visited by a creature in the night that they stayed in their tent but they could hear it knocking things over and you know messing with their cooler and stuff like that and the next morning when they came out uh they discovered that it had peed on their swimsuits which were on a uh on a log and it was of course this horribly foul stench mm -hmm. you know <laughs> on their stuff and and that just the behavior of, of whatever creek you know they they were they were pretty sure they knew what it was but they hadn't seen it but right the fact the fact that it would pee on their clothes uh just sort of freaked them out sufficiently that uh it just made them all the more determined to get the hell out of there. I think they left a lot of things behind when they, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a dominance situation. Yeah. There. Yeah. It's like, wow. And there's, there's no way to answer that because they're not going to leave their swimsuit out there. You can't run pee on their swimsuit. You know what I mean? It's you just kind of have to like take the message. You know. Well, <laughs> I, I guess if you were prepared, you'd take bleach because you know, what I was told through my sources was that's what, that's what is done. Uh, because whatever has the strongest odor is comes oh. out on top in that particular oh. confrontation, and you know. and bleach is definitely stronger than their pee. Why do you know? Wow! So you could you could t so if you had to mark your territory and you were you could use bleach to mark it. Yeah, fascinating. So for anyone out there who's having trouble with these things, you know, if, if that's if they're encroaching on your home or whatever, you know pour bleach around the perimeter of your area and don't do it just once do it repeatedly because that's you clearly demarcating your territory versus what they're trying to do gotcha so that even even advise that over because i i know that it, we'd advise the the people sort of collect their own pee and then mark the territory with their own pee but yeah it's bleach. probably not strong enough wow bleach so bleach, bleach is the way to go yeah and more sanitary you know true True. Yeah, it's better than going out and peeing on your front lawn. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not as controversial. Yeah. Well, fellas, I think we're about out of time for this segment. Adam, thanks for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. I had a great time. And Thank you, folks. Stay tuned for the third segment. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs>